Taylor. Taylor, they got a bomb. Atomic bomb. What type is it? What do you mean, what type? It's an atomic bomb. That's like someone just blew up a hospital in guitar. What type of hospital? Who cares what type? What would even prompt someone to ask that? Honestly, the only reason he asks is to force a big reveal. No numbers. Just just some letters on on one, one of the fins. Greek letters. Alpha and, and Omega. What? Why, whatever could that mean? L let me explain something. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last letter. They symbolize the beginning and the end. Together, they symbolize eternality, like something that exists at both the very beginning and the very end. It's standard religious imagery. If the Voldemorts here worship the bomb, it's easy to see why they would use an Alpha and an Omega symbol. But no, Taylor realizes that this means it's a doomsday bomb. A doomsday bomb. Uh, hold on. So there was an all-out nuclear war, and someone decided they better not use the doomsday device? I can sort of see how that might make sense, but I'm just not sure I understand the thought process here. Sir, it's the Soviets! They've launched nuclear missiles at us! Hundreds of them! Well, if we're going down, we're taking those commie pieces of scum with us. We'll make a big smoking crater of this entire planet. Oh, but don't arm the doomsday bomb we built just for this purpose, because that'd just be crazy. Oh, and wouldn't a good symbol for a bomb that could destroy everything just be Omega? Why the Alpha symbol? Oh, and how come Brent knows about the bomb and Taylor doesn't? Taylor was our prisoner longer. And they gave him some nice fresh clothes before Brent showed up. Then they tried to kill him because he knew too much, but he still doesn't know their entire culture revolves around a bomb? It's operational. They intend to use it. How did... How... What? These people's culture revolves around worshipping a bomb. To them, it's not just holy and sacred, but deified. And they're planning to blow it up. This movie's a genius. I wonder how they even managed to find a fully functional doomsday bomb. In 2000 years, none of the radioactive materials leaked out, and the firing mechanism is still fully operational. Do me a favor. Uh, plug in a PlayStation 3 2000 years from now, and tell me if it still works. Thanks, I'll wait. So the apes venture forth and Dr. Zayas notices a cave and suggests the entire army check it out because it can only be the mysterious something that they're all looking for and know nothing about. Is that the same cave from earlier? Come on, this is stupid! When Brent stumbled onto it earlier there was no wall of flame to dissuade him and he's sure his monkey guts didn't pass an entire destroyed city to find it. Or are there just dozens of caves everywhere that lead right into old abandoned subway stations? Well, there's that bus painting again, so I don't know. It's not like I think this is something they should explain better. I just feel like if they did, no matter what explanation they use, it would be grotesquely stupid anyway. What will you do, Holiness? Everything necessary. You hear that? These guys are through messing around. They're gonna do whatever it takes to stop these apes. You know, except for using that special power that can make them all kill each other without even being nearby. Or that special technique where they do anything at all! Brent and Taylor have been left alone all this time, despite the fact that the mutant that tried to kill them used to be accompanied by another guy, and Nova was being escorted by a guard who I guess forgot to chase her. And even though they have psychic powers, this guy doesn't send any kind of telepathic warning. Hey guys, I am being murdered in here. All this, plus of course the ape invasion, allows Brent and Taylor to figure out how to get out of their cell door. They grab this spike thingy and do... something, and it opens. Nice work, guys. You thinking what I'm thinking? No. I'm thinking what? Something. What are you thinking, Taylor? I'm not psychic, and nothing you idiots do in this movie makes any sense, so you're pretty much unpredictable. Well, I guess Brent figures it out and takes one of the weapons the peaceful dopes keep insisting they don't have 
try to understand, the only weapons we have are purely illusions. And they wait for a gorilla to wander away from his squad, and then squander their element of surprise by jumping in too early and letting him get a few shots off before attacking. Nova dies anticlimactically. And Brent berates Taylor for wasting time by caring about his only companion. Come on, come on. Nice, buddy. One of the psychics poisons herself. And then this creepy thing happens. Finally, the gorillas use their combined might to beat down this door that isn't even barricaded. And this leader guy, you know, none of these skinless wonders seem to even have a name in this, unveils his messiah. The apes are totally dumbfounded that he can speak, even though none of them showed much of any surprise at their strange clothing, the ancient wreckage, the busts of human figures, or that one of them managed to intentionally poison herself. So they kill the guy, and then decide to knock the big bomb over. You don't know what you're doing! Ah! It'll kill us all! How does he know that? How would Dr. Zayas have any idea what a nuclear bomb is? After the thing breaks open and unleashes deadly gas, Ursus seems more intent on pressing random buttons that might just kill them all than evacuating. Ursus' reason for doing this is so stupid, too. I'll find a way to stop it. Come on, you just broke a container that released deadly gas. And you're looking for a button to stop it from leaking? How does he even understand the concept of computers with buttons that can do complex things? Why does he expect that pressing a button can just fix a big metal object that he split open? And if he's determined to press buttons to figure out if it can help, why is he taking his time to slowly reach for that one button? Your troops are dying! So Brent distracts them by hitting a few keys in the organ. They all shoot Charlton Heston, then Brent shoots Ursus, then they all shoot Brent. Why does this feel like a shaggy dog story? And then, since killing off all the main characters isn't enough, Taylor asks Zayas for help, and when he refuses, as a final screw you, Taylor figures he might as well destroy all life on Earth and sets off the bomb! The man so condemning of humanity's destructive nature and so emotionally distraught at the destruction his people wrought just exploded everything! This is seriously how he repays Zira and Cornelius for all they've done for him? And what about Zira's nephew Lucius? He doesn't value their lives even a little bit? This is seriously how the movie ends. After everything goes all white, then fades to black, there's a brief voiceover that explains how the entire planet just winked out of existence, and so we might as well go home and forget about there ever being a Planet of the Apes franchise. A green and insignificant planet is now dead. Can any of you understand my confusion at this? This is my DVD set. So far we've watched this many movies, and we have this many left to go. How does that work? When I said I would review this movie, a user on the forum had this to say. I like Beneath. Please don't be too harsh on it. Well, they should have thought of that before they blew up the universe! This movie is Venom in the franchise's veins. If the series was a family, this movie is the mentally unstable adopted son who shoots everyone in the family and then offs himself before the police show up so he doesn't get brought to trial. It has more plot holes than plot points. None of the characters' motivations make any sense. It's like they all know what they have to do to advance the plot and just make up excuses to do it no matter how weak. Speaking of characterization, is Brent supposed to be a huge jerk? Because he is, and I don't even think it's intentional. It's like the screenwriter has no idea how people interact with each other. He just does whatever seems dramatic regardless of how it makes his characters act. Sure, when Brent tells Taylor, come on, come on, over his dead companion, they do have to stop a bomb from going off, so there's sort of a reason for him to be a jerk. But how about how the first thing he does when he lands on what he thinks to be an alien planet and makes contact did with one of the natives you? is yell at her. Where did you get in the part this? where he comes to Zira and Cornelius, they're total strangers and he's just expecting them to drop everything and help him. 
The two of them do go out of their way to help, lying to protect him and then giving him clothes and guidance. The best they get out of him is a half-hearted thanks. Thanks. Thank us by finding Taylor. Yeah, if he's still alive. What a thing to say! Yeah, thanks for the help, I suppose. Oh, and by the way, Taylor might be dead. See ya! Even in editing this movie, I'm constantly discovering problems in the story I didn't notice before. Look at the protest scene. It's like they just grabbed a bunch of actors and dressed them up like apes and threw them on the set. Hey, uh, what's our motivation? Oh, uh, the gorillas want to go to war and you don't want them to, so you're protesting. Ready? Action! Uh, free freedom! Peace! Freedom! Plot devices are tossed in with zero care. Like, remember the dog tags that were so crucial to this movie's plot since it allowed Brent to figure out that Nova was connected to Taylor and it helped Taylor to teach Nova the one word she manages to speak? Those dog tags literally came from nowhere. In the first movie, they didn't even have dog tags. And even if they did, Taylor lost all his belongings during the hunt early in the movie. And plot elements that should be important are treated with such indifference. Most importantly, when Ursus announces his plan to go to war against nothing, he contends that whatever is in the Forbidden Zone must eat. Later, he remarks that nothing can be worse than starvation. This could have been an important piece of the story that explains that they would take such a stupid and desperate course of action. But it never plays a role in the story. At all. You never see apes wasting away on the side of the street. No one ever says, another orangutan died today. The only civil unrest is over the war. Dr. Zayas certainly looks well fed. And look, the plan to stave off starvation is to invade a desert. Here's a free tip for you, General. Nothing grows there! We never see the psychics eating or talking about their diet. And when the apes invade, we never see them raiding food supplies. So we never get an answer about how they survive in the desert. When there's a major subplot about a food shortage, this is an important detail! In that scene where Brent shows up at Zero's place, Sheen Cornelius are even like, Sure, take as much food as you need, we've got a big pile right here, come on! You know, IMDB has a goofs page about this movie, and you know what it says? Absolutely none of the hundred or so goofs I spotted are even mentioned. We have a few points about how the destroyed subway station, Queensboro Plaza, isn't even a subway system, and how it's nowhere near the public library that Brent finds right next to it. I've never been to New York City, so naturally I didn't know any of this, but you'd think they'd research that just a little. I mean, I didn't do any research at all, and still noticed a gigantic number of mistakes. Do I seriously know more about theoretical physics and nuclear weapons with no formal education other than high school than a science fiction writer who could have easily studied up on what would be an important subject for the movie's plot? It just utterly amazes me that the Goofs page doesn't cover any of this. Oh, but look at what it has to say about items incorrectly regarded as goofs. Inconsistencies between different apes movies are not being listed. Time travel within the series has altered history and created infinite parallel universes. Each movie functions separately. BULL! Look, maybe the next few movies will do something weird with time travel, but there's nothing like that in the first two movies at all. If the whole Hessline theory about time in a vehicle traveling nearly the speed of light is too sciencey for you, just think of being cryogenically frozen. You go to sleep, you wake up in a few thousand years and have barely aged. It's the same principle. You can't create paradoxes and multiple timelines by moving forward in time. We're all moving forward in time. Right now. Look, see that? See that? A couple seconds just went by. I don't see any big rift being torn into the space-time continuum, do you? This is going to indeed sound strange, but... Oh, I didn't see... Okay. Beneath the Planet of the Apes is so much beneath the Planet of the Apes. And that wordplay works so well, I'm starting to wonder if this movie was the product of laziness or actual outright malice. Was the writer trying to ruin this? That would explain a lot. I looked it up, and this guy was one of the writers for Goldfinger. Yes, that Goldfinger. 
So you know he can write. Such little care is put into everything, and then all the characters are killed off at the end, and then the planet is blown up for good measure. Well, despite your best efforts, Mr. Paul Dean, you didn't kill off the franchise. It came back for more. And they hired you to write all the next ones? Hollywood! <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.